So Ben and Free is coming out later this month, and it got me thinking how we got to this point. We now have a movie based on Morbius, a Spider-Man villain that only kids who watch the 90s show will know about, a Madam Web movie, a Spider-Man character with literally no brand recognition at all, and a trilogy for Venom without any Spider-Man, arguably one of the most important characters in his origin. The conception of these movies is honestly insane, and it is a clear cash grab from Sony trying to milk the Spider-Man IP as much as it can by making their own connected universe without any care or effort. So because I love inflicting mental pain on my own psyche, I decided to rewatch the first few Venom movies before the third one came out as a little blast from the not so far past of 2018 and 2021. And wow, I wasn't so pleased. In this video, I'm going to be looking into the history of the film and how it came to be, and then do some critical analysis in the first movie in this duology of shite. Hopefully by the time I'm done with this video, I still got some steam in the engine to talk about the second one, as that was actually somewhat enjoyable. For mediocre slop, that is. But oh well, on to why they made a Venom. To answer this question, I'm gonna have to go over some Venom movie lore. So if you're only here for my rants, ravings, and praises, skip to this part of the video. So Venom film has been in the works for a while now. All the way back in 1997 when it was first conceived in the brain of Avi Arad. And if you don't know who he is, essentially he's a big producer when it comes to Marvel movies and he's been for some time now and even gives inputs on their scripts. Here's another idea that's gonna be very controversial. Um, Most of the time for the worst. Especially when it comes to Spider-Man. He is the reason we got Venom in Spider-Man 3, despite heavy pushback from Sam Raimi. Because us fans really wanted to see Venom, and not another well put together Spider-Man movie with a villain we will remember for decades to come. Such an absurd thought, like all we want is Venom. In reality, um, Arad is just a businessman who wants to put this marketable cash cow on as many projects as possible on the big screen to sell toys. So after the poor reception that Venom's inclusion brought to Spider-Man 3, the Venom solo movie that Avi has been curling his toes over for years now was sent right back out into development hell for even longer. Later down in the timeline, however, in 2014, The Amazing Spider-Man 2 came out with not-so-amazing praises, and due to its poor reception, any sequels and spin-offs that were planned to be connected to The Amazing Films were scrapped. And Spider-Man was to be rebooted for a second time within the decade, but within the MCU under Disney supervision. This purge of projects included a Venom spin-off movie, and it was sent outside and put down once more. However, this now left Sony in a position where they themselves weren't making Spider-Man films with Peter Parker being the main lead, to them probably signing a deal with Disney that only they could do that or some legal shenanigans. Which create a perfect gap for them to create movies with other Spider-Man characters being put front and center, and who better than to do that with than Black Spider-Man himself, Miles Morales, and Venom. So like a phoenix rising from the ashes, the Venom movie rose from the pits of development hell and after many years of waiting and not really any anticipation, on the 8th of February 2018, the Venom teaser trailer was dropped and we got the first look of the movie. And surprisingly, it looked promising. It gave a darker tone to what was expected from superhero movies at the time, and it felt as if it was going to lean into more of being a psychological horror, but that isn't what we got at all. Instead, we got another generic superhero origin story with a lot of potential yeah. squander due to a poor script and lack of understanding and what makes the titular character interesting to begin with. Today you must die, but more on that later. Before I forget, something that made this movie's marketing so confusing is if it was in the MCU or not. People were so confused and if this movie fit in the MCU that not even Amy Pascal, an executive for Sony and one of the main producers behind Venom and several other Spider-Man films knew the answer to this question. It has been thrown around there that Marvel wanted to see how it performed with critics before giving it the MCU staple, and the main reason it was PG-13 was so Sony could try and appease the Disney. However, this is just speculation, and the main reason for it most likely being PG-13 was so it could reach as large an audience as possible, because we all know how much Abby loves the coin. Money. 
Now that I've rambled on about why this movie was made and some of his backstory, let's talk about some of the things it actually does well. What the hell are you? We are them. To start off with, the intro is actually pretty good. It establishes the main antagonist of the movie, Carlton Drake and Riot. Then we get to see some of the symbiote's abilities, such as how it bonds with its host and its capability of healing said host. Plus, it does this all for a show don't tell. The music in this scene is also well composed and helps further set the tone of an unknown horror and threat coming to Earth. I like how they characterize Eddie throughout the movie. He's just such a loser after the intro, constantly coming across as an absolute mess of a man, and how he ruined his own life due to his own self-absorbed motives fits really well for the character. The little intro he got from the Eddie Brock show was a great way to have a diegetic introduction to Eddie that also served as a nice piece of world building. He does have some growth, and I like how he and the symbiote play off of each other as their dynamic is the most interesting part of the movie, despite how little time they actually spend together. It's also really refreshing that it didn't make Eddie a symbol of sex appeal. Instead, they had him running around looking manic as fuck and a grimy hoodie drenches his own sweat for the majority of the movie. They saved all the sex appeal for the big black goo monster. Now that is subverting expectations and putting tropes on their head correctly. The first fight scene with Venom, after 50 minutes into the movie, in Eddie's apartment is honestly so well done. It's a good way to tease the abilities of the symbiote before going full Venom. The choreography actually gets pretty creative as well, in ways that they use the symbiote to dispatch the goons throughout the scene. The score that is used in this scene is so satisfying, and honestly one of my favorite themes in superhero movies as a whole, as it truly captures the power that the symbiote has, and it fits amazingly for its reveal. It's also great how much of this action scene was filmed with using practical effects, especially in the chase sequence. The CGI used blends in well, which creates an action scene that is easy on the eyes and engaging to watch. A lot of effort went into this part of the movie, and it clearly shows. Also, at the end of the fight scene, just seeing how Eddie gets mangled at the end of the chase by going full send into the road and then getting healed is pretty awesome, and again, it showcases the abilities of the symbiote once more. Plus, that line from Venom goes so hard in a comedic and genuinely terrifying manner. Tom Hardy not only playing Eddie Brock, but the symbiote was a surprising choice, but how they got his voice to sound when speaking as a symbiote was so effective and pleasing to the ear. The way he delivers those lines of a different pace and articulation than Eddie really sells the fact that this is not an extension of Eddie, but its own character of its own distinct personality. It's an issue many adaptions of the symbiote seem to really struggle with. They just treat it like a mindless pile of goo with no character or personality of its own. So points to the Venom movie for getting that part correct at least. Dan is a surprising MVP of the movie. He isn't just a throwaway love interest for the lead's ex-partner like so many of her movies like do when having a broken up couple. He also isn't an asshole and is genuinely kind and concerned for Eddie when he probably really shouldn't be. And it feels so refreshing to have a character that fits that archetype and not act in a way they traditionally are portrayed. She Venom was cool to see, and how they transferred the symbiote got a little giggle for me. And since this movie was not going for the more dark psychological horror side of Venom at all, this goofy ad moment gets a pass from me. Just wish we had more of it. The last few minutes of this movie is great as it finally had Eddie and the symbiote become one. We are them. And I wish it had more of that as it's much more interesting than any other dynamic in the film. It leans in the wacky side of the character more, which when this movie did that, it was executed really well. That's really all the praise I have for this movie, and it saddens me truly that I don't have more. Now, to the bad. Excluding the intro, everything before the six month title card is not necessary. It only serves as exposition, and everything here could have been established in a more natural manner during the main events of the movie. 
and we could have had an ongoing mystery of what Eddie did that sent him into such a downward spiral in life. What they should have done is after the intro, it should have cut to the Eddie Brock show. Then after that, smash cut to him sitting in the bar, 15 drinks down and acting all depressed. This would have been a better introduction to Eddie, as we would still see how much better he was doing before his big blunder, but establish who he is and that he did something wrong to ruin his life, and create a layer of mystery that can slowly unravel as the movie goes on. We'd also be able to cut out a lot of unnecessary padding and get quicker to Eddie and the symbiote bonding. Speaking of, it takes 50 minutes for Eddie and the symbiote to bond. It is a crime that in the Venom movie, it takes this long for Venom to show up. This movie also isn't that long either, so it really shouldn't be wasting its time with Eddie and his boring ass failed relationship where there is next to no chemistry at all. Like damn, that shit is more dry than a neglected dog's water bowl. Give us more time with Eddie and the symbiote together to further develop the relationship as is what's expected from a movie called Venom. What makes this so irritating is that Tom Hardy wanted to say that around 30 to 40 minutes of footage was cut from the movie. And from what he said, it makes it seem that this was more scenes involving Venom. If it was anything like that deleted car alarm scene, then it's a damn shame, as more of that would have been great. Eddie Brock as a character also doesn't need a love interest. It genuinely is a waste of time. That plotline doesn't add anything of value to the movie, and it takes away from exploring more interesting plotlines and characters. Speaking of Eddie, I am conflicted with Tom Hardy's performance in this movie. As I know Eddie is meant to be this drunk, pathetic fool, but some of his lines he is just slurring and sounds so half-ass. At times, like in the lobster scene, it is meant to be comical, but others such as when he is freeing his homeless friend from the container, it just sounds like he doesn't care at all. It really should have chosen a side either comical or serious as this mishmash of the two things was not lacking half the time. Then there's Eddie's other half, the symbiote, or as this movie decided to call it, Venom. I'll get into that later. But Venom as a character is pretty paper thin. He has an arc from being on board of the symbiote invasion and then because he spent maybe a couple hours of Eddie and sees San Francisco from up high, he now wants to help prevent the invasion and stay on Earth? However, we as an audience do not spend enough time with Venom himself to be shown why he likes Earth and we don't see enough of him and Eddie interact to show him build this kindred spirit of Eddie. So this arc doesn't feel earned at all. It's another reason why we needed the two to bond earlier in the movie, to have their dynamic and relationship more fleshed out, so this change of heart from Venom is justified and not feels as rushed as it is. The main villain, Carlton Drake, is actually so over the top. He is so comically evil with him repeatedly spouting mini monologues and quotes to make himself sound profound. He's just evil for the sake of being evil. We don't have a sad backstory or motivation, and honestly this wouldn't be anything to be fussed about if more of the movie as a whole went into being this wacky and absurd. My favorite moment from him has to be when the little girl in the school trip goes to ask him a question, and all our class starts sushing her, but he reassures her not to let people silence her, asking questions is important, but then proceeds to divert the conversation and not even answer her question at all. Like this motherfucker, it's so like comically evil and like I don't know if this was intentional but I will give the movie props because it's the best joke in the movie intentional or not so well done Venom 2018 you got me his henchmen are also just extremely dumb like why did they walk Eddie out into the woods to execute him and not just mag dump him in the lab like they had no problem with all the homeless folk getting murked by symbiotes so I don't see why this is any different Eddie himself also just looks homeless, so like it, it's it's really is no different. Um. Then there's a second big bad, who is Carlton's other half, the symbiote Riot. And honestly, there isn't much to say. He's just another big gray CGI monster whose only motivation is to start the symbiote invasion. And well, what is it? What is it literally to say? He's he's literally just a nothing burger of a character. They could have made him blue, like in the comics, so when he and Venom fight, it would have been easier to tell them apart. But no, no, no. Visual clarity was not a priority when making this movie. It also takes over 1 hour and 11 minutes for Carlton and Ryan to bond, which I've already delved into why it's an issue of Eddie and Venom, but the movie is almost over at this point. Why did this not happen much earlier? 
It probably could have happened at the beginning when the symbiotes crashed to Earth and the Life Foundation found them. Instead of sneaking away, Riot could have made his way to Carlton, except spending the majority of the movie traveling from Asia to America, to end up where he would have been if, I don't know, he hopped onto one of the Life Foundation goons at the crash. It's so dumb. Also, what's the deal with the symbiotes only being able to bond to the perfect house? The idea that some are better than others makes sense, yes, but having it where it's just impossible for most folk just makes the idea that the main villain and protagonist, who knew each other before, being perfect for symbiosis, kinda contrived and convenient. This whole needs to be for the perfect host also makes Eddie Brock come across as special, which is not needed at all for his character. He isn't a chosen one, just some guy who had his life ruined by his own hubris and he blames on Peter Parker and at his lowest point bonded with a space parasite with abandonment issues that was also caused by Peter Parker. Speaking of the webhead, his complete absence from this plot is what ultimately makes this adaptation of Venom so planned, and the biggest issue of this movie. Don't get me wrong, they made an attempt, and it isn't half bad. But without Spider-Man, you completely axe out a majority of the origin and arc of what makes Venom, Venom. This is because in the comics, Venom isn't the symbiote. No, no, no. Venom is the name of the symbiote and Eddie as one. One entity that is meant to be poison to Spider-Man. From now on, we're poison to Peter Parker and Spider-Man. We're Venom! Hence why the two together named themselves Venom. However, the movie doesn't have Spider-Man or any kind of fill-in to justify the name, so they just made the symbiote names Venom. Without Spider-Man, we don't get to see that transition from villain to anti-hero that Venom goes through. This takes away from the character development from Eddie and the symbiote, as in the comics they both had their own issues with Peter, but over the years they start to redeem themselves and get over their shared hatred of the web-slinger, even becoming an ally and friend to him. So he just starts as an anti-hero in this movie, and there's no conflict on if they should be a hero or a villain, like in the comics, and it's flat out less compelling. Also, because Venom didn't bond with Spider-Man before Eddie, we're left with this big black veiny monster without any spider logo or ability to web swing. Which is tragic, as this design for the movie is honestly so close to being perfect, but it is missing that iconography that it completes Venom's look. The lack of web swinging is also a crime. They just make him jump and leap everywhere, which is far less interesting to watch. They should have honestly made this a Spider-Man vs Venom movie, but we completely told from Eddie's perspective as we don't need a trilogy to establish Spider-Man as a character anymore. He can just be there and serve as an antagonist to Venom. Then the next movie could have been Venom trying to become a hero, and the third would be Venom and Spider-Man team up to defeat Carnage. Maybe even give Spidey a mini arc of forgiveness. Boom. Small scale street level stories that have much more potential for faithfully adapting Venom. But that's just my opinion. This movie also felt like it was having a tonality tug of war between being serious and wacky. I'm not saying such a thing isn't possible as you have the Sam Raimi Spider Man movies, which handle this balance pretty well, but in this movie, it doesn't feel as natural or well executed. Another thing that this movie has against it is its PG 13 rating. Now I don't think it's entirely necessary, but it definitely holds this movie back. Call me a sicko, but it'd be nice to just see Venom rip people limb from limb. It would hammer in how much of a destructive force of nature the symbiote is, and with an R rating, you can do that. The film could have also delved deep into some more mature themes and related to the psychological toll the symbiote can cause to the psyche that a PG-13 movie would be suppressing. It also would probably do extremely well financially, as the year before the first Deadpool movie came out smashing the box office showing the demand and market for R-rated superhero movies does exist. When the credits came, I was scared by the song in the end. I can't lie, I completely forgot this song existed as I must have purged it out of my mind, but ever since re-watching this movie, it has been like a poison. Almost like a... Okay, I promise this is the last time I make that joke. This song, however, is just so bad and such a strange collaboration that I'm glad it exists out, of, out there. I'm glad that it exists because it falls into meme territory and I love meme songs that were not meant to be memes. Speaking of end credits, oh my god that wig on Woody Harrison looks awful and the dialogue is so ham fisted with that carnage line like Jesus Christ what were they thinking. Stop, please, I beg, just stop. You're embarrassing yourself. Stop.
So in summary, that's really all there is to say about the first Venom movie. Yes, it was a massive hit at the box office, and also sired a few more, at best, mediocre films. But that doesn't change the fact that this adaptation had great potential, but it was ultimately squandered due to a lack of understanding of what makes the character of Venom so interesting. The exclusion of Spider-Man and the lore behind that doesn't help this either. The worst part of these movies isn't that they are poor adaptations of great characters. Except for you, you're kinda ass. It's a fact that Sony most likely won't allow them to be used in the MCU, as they don't want to be one-upped by Disney or create confusion when it comes to the universe. Well, most of the time. I won't forget the uproar from the Morbius trailers. So yeah, we probably won't see Venom or Kraven interact with Spider-Man on the big screen for some time due to the spump converse, which is a shame, but that is just how the cookie crumbles, I guess. So. See you next time when I rant about the second spawn of the Spawnverse. Why did I do this to myself?